Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. So this morning, um, the Dhamma reflection and contemplation for all of us is on uh, right speech, um, a huge topic, and one that uh, involves a lot of um, off the cushion practice. I believe it also is on the cushion practice and we'll talk about that, but something that certainly um, we need to have supported by a great deal of mindfulness and um, an area that involves lots of practice um, and lots of development. <clears throat> so like all of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha defines right speech very specifically um, in the suttas that uh, right speech uh, must be true, it should be beneficial, it should be spoken with the heart of metta, spoken with kindness and timely. And when we look at the fourth precept that really um, is completely related to right speech, we have the training that we undertake when we take the five precepts. The fourth precept involves us um, taking the precept mujavada, um, which really specifically is um, false speech. But if um, very often in the suttas, when it gets expanded, uh, it actually is the counter to the four aspects of right speech. So and when I first heard this, I just, it was easy for me to remember because I thought, oh, it's alphabetical, F-G-H-I, not, not false speech, not gossip, not harsh speech, not idle speech. Actually, I still use that <laughs> to, just to remember, not, not false, not gossip, not, not harsh, and not idle. And that, that really, um, links to the aspects of right speech. So not false, the Buddha is asking us for our speech to be true and um, not uh, um, gossip. Um, the Buddha is asking for our, our speech to be beneficial and not harsh. The Buddha is asking for our speech to be spoken with a heart of metta, with kindness and um, not idle. And the Buddha is asking for our speech to be timely. And I think that timely um, can't be emphasized enough. And I think it can be expanded to include uh, a term that gets talked about quite a bit in the United States here. I know you're all in Canada um, of considering someone's social position with all of the racial unrest and the 400 years of systemic racism in, in this country and with um, more, um, at least more airtime and more understanding of patriarchy and more understanding of homophobia. I'm not saying that these things are addressed, but at least that they're coming into the consciousness of the society. So understanding when I speak, I'm really understanding my social position. If I'm a white person and I'm speaking with a person of color, a great deal of difference in our social position in society. And so an example would be if um, we're, we're in a, a discourse where we're talking about our needs, it's much more important as a white person that I consider the needs of the person of color. They, they, they 
they're more important actually than my needs because because of this momentum of so many years of, of the white person getting their needs met and the person of color not. And so it's not just when, when we think about timely and when we think about social position, when I'm having an interaction, it's not just me, I ahimsa, it's also the context, the history, the, the social strata, the economic, the educational, all of those are, are also because I'm not actually a person, right? Like I'm, we know that I'm not, I'm, I'm a, a conglomerate of causes and conditions. And when I'm speaking, I need to be aware of this, all of these, well, not that I can be aware of all of them, but I, I'm taking context very much into consideration. I didn't mean to talk about that for so long. But so I just wanted to start with the definition of right speech. And um, now, actually, I would like to just um, look at a few suttas that I have found very instructional about how do you do this? How do you, I mean, I think that the easy one, the easiest one is, sorry, shouldn't say that. <clears throat> truth to me seems quite straightforward, you know, uh, and um, the pre I found the precept actually very helpful, especially when I became an anagarica, because I was doing this precept every two weeks and I started to see um, uh, it was built into the training that you had to talk about ways that you had um, you know, not been able to um, keep that precept. And the fourth precept was the one that I was over and over and over again having to talk about. And I started to see all the times that I exaggerated in stories so that, you know, it was more funny or I looked better in some way or I looked worse in some way, you know, more extreme, like more of a, uh, you know, impact and, um, and I also saw several times that I would sort of fudge the lines and cover things up so that I didn't look, I, I had a lot of conditioning about um, being blamed or being feeling responsible or feeling inadequate. And so there were lots of times it was hard for me to own up to things I had forgotten or things that I had said or done that um, weren't the greatest. So, um, so um, I'm gonna actually, all of the suttas I'm, we're gonna look at are in the Majima and um, one of the most amazing suttas to me about speech and about um, harmony. Harmony is so important for us to have harmony in our lives, in our hearts, in our relationships, in, in our living situations. And um, a lot of our ignorance leads to disharmony in our own hearts, in our own conversations, in our own relationships. And there's a wonderful sutta um, in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 139. It's a, the exposition of non-conflict. And um, I'm just going to read. Uh, there, there are several things in this sutta. But the first one I'm going to read is, um, it, if, if you have the book, I'll tell you the page. It's on um, page um, 1,084, and it's verse 11. And I found this instruction extremely, the Buddha is saying, one should speak unhurriedly, not hurriedly. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said. This happens often in the sutta. It's like it's a, a teaching was given in brief, and then the, the monks are like, no, nah, you know, 
what does that mean? And then the Buddha will give it in detail. So that's what's happening here. He had said kind of a list, and now he's going back to the list. So one should speak unhurriedly, not hurriedly. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said? Here, bhikkhus, when one speaks hurriedly, one's body grows tired and one's mind becomes excited. One's voice is strained and one's throat becomes hoarse. And the speech of one who speaks hurriedly is indistinct and hard to understand. Here, bhikkhus, when one speaks unhurriedly, one's body does not grow tired, nor does one's mind become excited, one's voice is not strained, nor does one's voice throat become hoarse, and the speech of one who speaks unhurriedly is distinct and easy to understand. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should speak unhurriedly, not hurriedly. So I've actually found this um, really helpful when I'm getting angry. <laughs> When it's, and I think that's what the Buddha's talking about. When you're starting to get upset and irritated and excited and agitated, if you remember to not speak hurriedly, it just, it's just like, uh, it's like stopping and taking a breath. You know, it's like that pause. It has the same effect. It's like, you know, when you feel like you're not being heard or you, when you're not being considered, if you just don't speak hurriedly. And here it is right in the suttas, the Buddha suggesting this. And then he right, right next, another thing that's extremely practical um, for harmony. The next verse, verse 12, it's the next thing on the list. One should not insist on local language and one should not override normal usage. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said. And uh, I'll just read it quickly. The Buddha is going on to say, basically, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Like, don't get all insistent on your views, your ideas, your, you know, you. Like, let it go. Like, think about the other person and and let things be, you know, and and this is great. You can kind of expand it. You know, if you're living with someone and they like the toilet paper roll to go with the, with the way I like it, the, the thing, you know, versus going like that, you know, or these little things, like if people put their, it just, just let things be. Don't insist on your way. Don't insist on local language and look for ways to build bridges, look for ways to build commonality, look for ways to build understanding. Um, here, Bhikkhus, does there come to be insistence on local language and overriding of normal usage here? Bhikkhus, in different localities, they call the same thing a dish, a bowl, a vessel, a saucer, a pan, a pot, a basin. So whatever, you know, basically, so whatever they call it in such and such a locality, one speaks accordingly, firmly adhering to that expression and insisting only this is correct. Anything else is wrong. This is how there comes to be insistence on local language and overriding normal usage. I find that very practical. And here it is in the suttas. So, <clears throat> um, I wanted to look at one other sutta, just some support that I've found for for this very thing of concord and uh, looking at our intention, not gossiping, not speaking harshly. And that's in Majjhima Nikaya 27. And this actually is in the suttas all over the place, all over the place. When the Buddha starts talking about right speech, he usually, he very often says this. So if, if you do have the book, it's on page 273, and it's Majjhima Nikaya 27, verse 13. Actually, part, part way through verse 13. <clears throat> so I'll read this. It's, um, it shows how much the Buddha really understood the human mind. Abandoning false speech, 
he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to the truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no disturber of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, the gossip, he abstains from malicious speech. He does and this, I, want, I really want us to, to take in. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these. Nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus, he is the one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendships, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. And then the Buddha goes on about abandoning false, uh, harsh speech and ab abandoning idle chatter. But I think that, that those sentences, he talks about himself, that that's the way he was. And this is something that he is really, really, when I think of right speech, I think of this sentence. You know, I don't repeat here what I heard elsewhere that's going to, you know, divide. And I, I guess I had to take, I, this is something I constantly have to work on, you know, because there's such a tendency in the human mind to sort of go around and find people that think like I think, especially about her or them or those people. And, you know, it just, it's just reinforcing the ignorance that of, of my own views. And it, it, it's such a strong tendency. And I, I, um, just speaking for myself, I don't know if anyone here knows about the Enneagram, but if you do, um, if you do, nod your head. If you know about the Enneagram, okay, there's, okay, then I will say it. <laughs> there's enough people, three people. Uh, so I'm a two on the Enneagram. I'm a helper. And so a real, a very, very early patterning for me and my conditioning was um, just a survival strategy for me was I, I was very much picking or can it got can, I don't know how all these things work but anyway connection was very very important for me is very important for me connection to other and it's kind of a at a, a survival level and so I think as a strategy through my life I've tried to have that connection by similarity by sameness by if you think what i the way i think then i feel close to you i feel connected and um it's just lately and so that leads to me sometimes gossiping or because i know oh this person doesn't super like that person either and you know and then but it started as a practice more to feel very unwholesome like this connection is it's it's not a good, not a good feeling anymore. And um, I've started to realize, oh, real connection comes through understanding, not through sameness. So it actually doesn't matter what you think or how you feel. If I'm trying to understand it, I'm coming, I'm coming close to you and connecting with you. And this has been extremely helpful for me with my patterning you know and that's not going to be that helpful for anyone if they don't have that patterning but just i guess i'm trying to talk about just how rich right speech is it, it, i think it goes because it, it goes to the core of of our conditioning and 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 peeling it back and 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 learning to practice right speech and and trying to understand um, what is the motivation for me when I'm choosing the other, when I'm, I'm habitually doing things that aren't right speech. That I, I think it's very important that I, I, I unravel that, that that's the way. To, you can't just, oh, I'm not going to talk about other people. That just doesn't work. I mean, it's just not the way we operate. You know, I see 
Sangamita and I haven't seen her for a long time. And then we start to talk, catch up about, oh, how so-and-so, how so that, you know, this is just the, what we do. And so um, it's very important to, un, to unravel where unwholesome um, speech is, is coming out. And of course it's starting with unwholesome thoughts. And there's, there's one last thing that I, I wanted to talk about. And I don't think that it's to speak about right speech and not talk about, and that is right listening. And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh says, deep listening is at the foundation of right speech. If we cannot listen mindfully, we cannot practice right speech. No matter what we say, it will not be mindful because we will be speaking only our own ideas and not in response to the other person. So right listening is indeed at the foundation of right speech. And I think that right listening is actually the key to us unraveling, unraveling those patterns of when we're speaking in a way that is not, not wholesome. And I think that the right listening, I'm gonna just refer to the Satipatthana. And again, an instruction the Buddha is giving us all the time about being aware of things internally externally and then both internally and externally. So I don't think that you can start to really uh, fulfill this path factor of right speech until you've done a lot of right listening. And, and I think that that right listening starts internally. Um, and then as we're doing right listening internally, then we can start to be doing right listening externally. Um, and uh, right listening is where the motivation is to understand, not, not to fix, not to reassure, not to question, not to even encourage, it's to understand and to reflect back to the person what it is we were hearing them say. Uh, this, this is huge. Um, there's a quote by George Bernard Shaw. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. The single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it's taking place. And I think that right listening is, is, the, is, is the answer. We're, we're really listening to understand. And honestly, this is meditation. Like that's what we're doing when we're meditating. We're, we're listening to this, to, to this, to understand it not to fix it, not to, you know, say it's not the way it is. As, as I've been looking at right listening in my own life, um, I'm realizing I'm, I'm terrible at this. I mean, I'm getting better bit by bit, but people will, you know, not that long ago. And this is, this is all stuff I've been thinking about a lot these last few months and not that long ago. I'm watching dishes with Ayananda Bodhi and I'm like, oh, what do you think of that thing? And then she starts telling me how, you know, she's so sad. And the first thing I said, well, it's not sad. So the first thing I said, she's, she's telling me she feels sad. I can't go, it's not sad. Well, I did, I did go, it's not sad, but, and that's kind of sad <laughs> anyway. But I, I do this. I tell people, no, it's not what you're telling me this, but no, it's not like that. Or no, you're going to be fine. Oh no, it, it'll be, no, you're not, you're not, that's not how you're feeling right now. Anyway. And it's not up to me. Anyway, I'm sort of rambling now. I'm going to, 
I'm going to stop. But I did want to say one last thing, and that is when we think about right speech, when we're on this theme of internal, external, both internal and external, is to really think about the, the inner speech. You know, is it truthful? Is it beneficial? Is it kind? When we're when we're doing self talk, um, so there. I mean, you could just talk about right speech for a long time, but I won't. I promise. I'll stop here. <laughs> so, thank you so much for your attention, and I would love to open it up because I find this. I think this topic is one of the riches for our for our day to day moment to moment practice. So, please, anybody things that they're, they're learning, quite anything is, is uh, welcome at this point. Thank you, Aya, that was uh, wonderful. <laughs> and I, I agree with you about the uh, listening part. Uh, one of the things I learned in my, in one of the psychiatry workshops I had gone to was, uh, the fellow's name was Bernie Gurney. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and what he taught, yeah, he, he, he had, um, like it was couples or two people and he'd, um, you'd pick up, you'd have something that was a talking stick. So I guess with natives, it would be like the peace pipe that you would hold and whoever was holding that was the speaker and everyone else would listen. So you just have any object close at hand. Um, and then whoever's holding that is the speaker and the other one is the listener. And if the speaker is saying things that sort of poke the listener, they have to sort of like zip it, hold in whatever their reactions are and just listen. And the speaker speaks in short paragraphs and pauses and then the listener paraphrases back. So the, so the speaker knows they have been heard. And if, if it's been misinterpreted, then they say it again and then, and then then when the speaker is satisfied they've been heard, then they, they pass the talking stick over <laughs> to the other person. Anyway, it's, um, it's fabulous, you know, absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Um, there's a Carl Rogers quote I had meant to read. When someone really hears you, without passing judgment on you, without trying to take responsibility for you, without trying to mold you, it feels damn good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, that, that could be a description of meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that we each, each time we sit down, we can be offering that to ourselves. I, I really, um, really appreciate uh, that talk. It, it's, um, I grew up in a family where uh, nobody listened, everybody talked over each other. And I'm, I know that that's probably quite typical. And, and uh, I, when I met my partner who became my wife a few years ago, I, she has this incredible habit of pausing before she speaks and it's it was so disconcerting because I didn't really understand what she was doing I was like did she hear my question did she misinterpret what I said I was like did you hear me honey and so I've learned to really respect her by stopping myself and listening and 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 waiting for her to speak and I, it was it's been it's been great. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. That that's something at the monastery at Aloka Bihara that um, the there's a pace of conversation because you have some fairly opinionated people and uh, wow it's it's um, it is something we hopefully are going to look at. Pace of conversation. And possibly in our, our really, really busy lives to, to sort of, you know, maybe book an appointment where you're sitting down and all you're doing is just 
listening and reflecting back on what the person says and instead of just trying to do that while you're while you're busy doing all your other things and mm -hmm. just really honoring that that process yeah this summer we had a, a couple of um listening circles where we, we we did have a talking stick and Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to go with this, but I, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated that that talk. I because uh, um, it's very much an area where where I'm working, um, and and the the deep listening within myself, and which is like my life meditation. I kind of carry it everywhere, on the cushion, off the cushion in the dialogues with, especially with like parents, um, where there's often quite a lot of unconsciousness. And so for me, I just like endeavor to stay really conscious and listening to what the in the, um, on the internal, so that the, uh, if there's pain or reactivity in there, it doesn't go into the, into my speech. Uh, there was a, a phrase that came to me uh, a while ago, like, um, don't let, don't let your pain slip out of your sight and into your tongue. That was, <laughs> that was my, 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 that came up for me, for myself, because, um, especially with like my dad, you know, I can get very reactive and to the extent that I'm able to sort of stay conscious of what's going on and, and like, and not let it slip into wrong speech um i can feel that you know the the potential for the relationship to be transformed mm -hmm. so it, it's mm -hmm. like a cutting edge of work and, and, and like you say i find it very challenging those old habits are very challenging and i also had that sort of childhood where you know like kind of like appease the person so that you don't um cause them to be angry with you so very much i've i've had a condition difficult conditioning of not being not sort of being um rewarded you could say for being honest with myself and speaking my truth and boy for me to learn that and come home to my honesty and my depth is um i just really appreciate your encouragement in that regard because i work there too yeah yeah we have some similar conditioning <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know that we were anic kind of anagarchas together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just uh, wanted to mention that um, I, I I really appreciated. Uh, um, that I always love it when teachers um, talk about their own journey, their personal journey, because it's so much easier to relate to something that feels. Um, like, oh, yes, that's where I am, too, then on a, a, an abstract level. So I really appreciate that. And I wanted to mention that, um, just in case people aren't familiar with it, and I don't know if I can remember it well enough, because it's from a few years ago. But I went to a Quaker workshop one time on circles of trust. And it was absolutely wonderful. There were a set of rules that for me as a mother, I, I need to go back because I was just thinking, do I remember them? And I thought, oh, my gosh, how could I have forgotten this? But I know there were things about when you're when you're talking to someone, don't fix, don't rescue, don't save, don't. So there was a list of things not not to do. And I was thinking about your comment, um, you know, when you told about the story of the dishwashing. Oh my gosh, that's my habit with my kids because I can't handle their pain. Um, so if I hear them expressing pain, I I want to. I want to reframe it for them right away. You know, oh, that's because you're you're thinking about this. You know, that kind of thing. Instead of just letting them um, express their pain and hearing it. And so, like I guess, you know, when I came home from that circle of trust, I taped this thing up uh, on my wall, so I look at it all the time. Well, I've moved recently, and things have been rearranged. And I just thought oh, I've forgotten it, so I'm going to dig it out <laughs> and put it back because it. Um, it was such a nice, precise um, guideline for that sort of listening. There's so many good tools out there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That I, I had totally meant to talk about that. That, that, that very thing. I mean, that is why I do it too. I can't be 
with the 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 pain yeah i can't be with you know i, I mean i'm starting to see and that and that i do it internally too i mm -hmm. tell myself that something's not the way it really is because i can't you know and i do think that this this satipatthana instruction internal external both internal and external i'm just seeing that in every area of like oh my gosh the reason I'm like this in relationship is because I'm like this in this relationship here. Yeah, I'm a mom as well, and my kids are just they're they're up to here with <laughs> they're just they're done. They in fact they just cut me off, which is a blessing, you know. I mean, I'm still doing it. They're in their 30s. Give me a break. You have four kids, <laughs> you know. Gee. Just, just to clarify, we we were <clears throat> we presented uh, I and Yannicka and I presented some of this some of this information to our community about deep listening is not it is not reassuring it is not giving advice it is not fix it is not me tooing like oh yeah I remember when that happened to me blah 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 and it it was a little bit difficult for people to get their heads around it because they're like oh but the especially the senior nuns so many people come to them to get advice you know and uh so it was really helpful to to, to clarify it's not that giving advice is not good giving advice is great you know reassuring someone is great encouraging someone that they they are up for up for the challenges that are in their life is great but it's not listening <laughs> you know listening is listening giving advice is giving advice and just to understand and that sometimes a lot in our white society we skip we're not mm -hmm. the listening does not get enough attention enough airtime and and i think that it's very respectful and honorable to actually check in with someone you know oh would you be interested in some advice mm -hmm. like maybe no maybe they just want to be heard still you know yeah and, and what i found out um you know with this talking stick way of of uh, communicating um is you know, usually, like in my relationship with my husband, um, we would just pull that out when it was a really sort of emotional issue. <laughs> we didn't do it sort of uh, every little thing there was to sort out, but for things where we knew the emotions would run high, we would do it. And, and just listening to each other usually solved the, the issue. Like very rarely did we have to go into problem solving after the listening was done because the listening fixed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a baseball cap, wasn't it? Yes, it was the baseball cap we used. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes where I go into reactivity is when I, I sense that the other person is uh, not deep listening. They're trying to fix me or solve me or they can't take the, the pain and whatever. So that's a challenge to work with that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. The we I and Yannick, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dear Lord. <laughs> I just going into, oh, I can give you some advice on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't. I'm just gonna stop there. That, yeah, I find that challenging too, Kati. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress, just, you know, to stay conscious and yeah. 
and 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 come from uh, stay conscious enough to come from the wholesome motivation yeah yeah to understand I'm, right and to see to kind of see see reality clearly enough yeah i still want to give you advice <laughs> Oh, I, I, I will receive advice if you'd like to offer. Oh, that's challenging. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we're at nine o'clock. Uh, no, 10 o'clock your time. Nine o'clock for Kathy and I. <laughs> um, does anyone else want to share anything? Is... Okay. Well, it's been absolutely delightful, really delightful to, to be with the group. And I'm Canadian. Hopefully at some point I will get to be there in person. I would love that so much. Yeah, I was yeah. sad that COVID prevented your- I know, your yeah, I actually had a ticket <laughs> on July 9th. Anyway. Thank you, Aya Ahimsa, thank you. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. It was lovely to see you. In, the, in all those leaves. <laughs> I'll do a chant, very quick blessing chant and, and sign off. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Buddhas. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Dhamma. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Sangha. May you ever be well. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And may you continue to make great progress on the path, each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Come back.